Welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, today is September 23rd, 2019. This is the meeting of the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction. And this meeting is being recorded. Audio and video. Audio and video. So the first item on our agenda is uh, officially changing the public forum date, uh, swapping one of our meeting times from 10 a.m. to noon on the 21st of October um, to make that a forum time so that people who can't come to evening meetings might be able to make it. Um, and then the um, we would have our regularly scheduled meeting instead at the forum time, which would be 7 p.m. that Wednesday, the 23rd. So is, just want to make sure that it's, that's okay with the rest of the committee. Yeah, I already have it scheduled for the 23rd at 7. Yeah, so instead of it being the forum, it would be the meeting. Okay. And then the, the uh, meeting on the 21st would be the forum instead of the meeting. So and that's at 10. That's correct. Okay. Yep. So we're just swapping. It's okay. the same dates that should be on our calendars, but we're swapping uh, the content of those meeting times. Okay. Can I move to approve that? Um, yeah. Second. Suggestion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. You have to ask if there's any more discussion. Oh, thank you. Is there any more discussion? Not for me. Okay. Everyone in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, so we have swapped those times. Um, while we're waiting, uh, hi. I'm hi, I'm Tony Kuzniers, school maintenance supervisor. Oh, great. Hi, Tony. Hi, how are Welcome. you? Welcome. Waiting for David. He'll be over in a minute. He's, okay. He's doing something in the office. All righty. Um, so according to my schedule from Lynn, we have the health department then it says here central services and school maintenance at 10 30. is that your understanding no no my understanding was 10. but well, we can come back at 10 30. okay well um do you have any idea when the health department's coming did she, she say? actually said to me 11. oh boy the times are all messed up okay then i think we're going to take i was pretty sure yeah originally our schedule was set 10. that's what i was okay saying, so unless things were changed the schedule that i received is incorrect so since you're here don't leave yeah, that's a good point. Um, let's just uh, take advantage of the fact that you're here. Right. Um, are you? Do you want to wait? For, I'll wait for David. Yeah. For so David. Or, okay. Yeah. So in the meantime, we'll just proceed with a couple other discussion items for our committee. Um, you don't mind me listening? Uh, no. This is a public meeting. Yeah, you can. We want you to know? You can stay for the whole meeting. <laughs> And you can I got watch, work to do after. <laughs> you, you can even watch it on, you know, NCTV yeah, you can watch in it your again. spare time. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, related to the forums, I just wanted to bring up um, the post, the draft posters that Elisa sent around yesterday. I had one comment on those draft posters, which was that the word green is in the title, green space. And I think we're talking about more than green spaces. Mm -hmm. I was wondering about that. So I don't know what the charge is. I don't have the charge in front of me, but that, that was interesting. Well, the, the charge doesn't say anything about green no. space. It just says, talks about municipal um, reducing pesticide use in, uh, in Northampton. So um, I suggested to Lisa that, she, that, they, that we delete the word green. And, and say maybe something like public spaces. In general, they strike me as very wordy. Yeah. And uh, I think that people are confronted with so much stuff to read that, and I mean, at least being an editor, would probably agree, mm -hmm. which is not here. Just that I think it can be significant in the text, which I understand she just put this out there as a first draft. Yeah. Okay. So shall we send her those two comments then, officially, as a committee that um, would like to reduce the words and the like to reduce the word green? Yeah. 
Absolutely. Okay, so do we do we need to make this a motion? I don't know. Let's just yeah. do it. Make it a motion. <laughs> I think that's a. Okay, I make I have a, I make a motion that we that we. Um, Department. To feedback to Elisa uh, about the but, forum poster that A is a little too wordy yeah, and B sure. uh, we'd like to replace the repeating with public. No, it's fine. We're yes. here. Second. Yeah. Yeah. Any more discussion? Get out of here. Well, I yeah, perhaps sorry, perhaps you could let me know I'd be happy to edit. Thank you. You know, to contribute that effort. Uh, and, and you can also send her a personal email to that effect if oh, you Oh, okay. And I also want to say I appreciate the the efforts with somebody volunteered to do this. I'm yeah. not sure that it, it looks really nice. The, all three and that um, I love the the color and I, it, it's <coughs> it's just nicely laid out yes. and um, that it's it's pleasing to the eye. And um, while we're asking for a few changes here, I think by and large these these are really great. Okay, so we would. I'll add that to my motion that we appreciate. All oh, yeah, that would be great. Yeah. <laughs> okay, any more discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Hello out there, Central Hi, Services and School Maintenance. Hello. Hi. Um, we would I'd like to. Uh, Thank you for coming and take advantage of the fact that you are here to um, uh, launch right into our conversation. But we would love it if you could just move up closer and maybe sit uh, somewhere along in here just so it's more comfortable sure. and we can sure. have more of a conversation than a testimony. I don't see the uh, Danish in coffee, so. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Had we known, yes. thank you very much for coming. Sure. Um, we are the Select Committee on Pesticide Reduction. We have been charged by the City Council to, to make recommendations on how Northampton uh, can reduce its use of pesticides. So we're interviewing all the relevant departments. Uh, I'm hoping that the questions that we forwarded to Lynn got forwarded to you all so you know what we're interested in asking you. Yeah, no. No. Okay, well. That's so okay. That's you're okay. going to ask anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And if you don't have the answers, then we will uh, deal with that another way. Okay. So how would you like to do this? Would you like to go sequentially or answer together? So we'll just let me take you a quick Broad picture. I'm sorry, I need names. Oh, sorry, yeah. I need names and uh, your titles. Minutes. Okay. All right, so 21. Tony Kuzniers. And Tony, could you say? Yep. K U S and Sam N I E R Z. Thank you so much. And you are the supervisor of school maintenance. Thank you. And you, sir. Dave Pomeranz, mm -hmm. director of central services. Thank you. Would you like us to introduce ourselves? Sure. I mean, sure. I don't have to. It's a group here. And do you know Cynthia? No. Okay. Uh, Cynthia Swopas, I sit on the board of health. Okay. Adele Franks, um, chairing this committee. Uh, Cynthia is our vice chair and our minute taker. Jim Nash, Ward 3 City Council. I'm Kate Simmons, and I'm an environmental chemist. Okay. And Elisa Klein is unable to mm -hmm. be here today. She's also uh, on this committee. Okay. All right. Yeah. So to give you just sort of an overview of why both Tony and I are here. So Central Services handles uh, maintenance, custodial and grounds operations and construction for both city and school facilities. <coughs> uh, so even though we are, we there, I have staff that, and Tony runs the school side for maintenance and then I have their staff that does the city side for maintenance. Everything is under the purview of Central Services. So we have shared resources, shared staff, um, mm. and that's been in existence since 1997 when counselors going way, way back before you guys um, deemed it appropriate to set up a central facilities department. Uh -huh. um, so we have different unions, but uh, there's a lot of shared resources and shared missions. Uh -huh. okay. um, so Tony can address 
because it's probably more prevalent and more relevant. Uh, talk about the school side first, okay. as far as what programs and resources we use that fall under you know, what we're going to call your pesticide management. Um, we can talk about grounds, you can talk about you know, interior of the buildings, mm -hmm. um, and then I can talk a little bit more about what goes on the city side, which is much less um, than what happens on the school side. So I'll let Tony jump in and then we can sort of mm -hmm. have a general conversation. Okay, so would it be helpful to you if we just reviewed the questions that we were hoping you were going to receive in advance? Sure, yeah. sure. Um, Let's step out real quick. Be right back. Okay. What pesticides are used in your department? How much is used every year? Where and how are they applied? To what extent is your department using alternatives to pesticides? What products and techniques are you using? How are they used and where? And what factors influence your decision about whether or not to use a pesticide? So, um, and by pesticide, we in, we're including. That's going to be my question. So, yeah. what are you including by the term pesticide? Yeah. The way it's used now, which is a little confusing, it includes everything. It includes mm -hmm. herbicides, mm -hmm. it includes rodenticides, it includes fungicides, it includes what we used to think of as pesticides mm -hmm. um, against um, chemicals to kill insects. Mm -hmm. um, herbicides. Herbi yep. Mm -hmm. Anything else you can think of? Gericides is a Yeah. So, so anything with any sides, mm -hmm. anything that is a side at the end. Mm -hmm. So it's pretty comprehensive now in the use of the term. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's how we consider it too. So. Right. Yeah. So I can just give you an overview. So from the school perspective, uh, primarily where we're using it is the high school and uh, outside of the grounds. So we maintain all the athletic fields. So we maintain them as we would a uh, normal turf field at your house. So we use a pre-emerging crabgrass and fertilizer in, in spring, broadleaf, treat dandelions, and then crabgrass throughout the year, and then fertilizers. We also use a crop control um, as needed down there so that we don't lose uh, the turf to crops. Um, and that's primarily what we use for pesticides. As needed, we use a, a bee spray to treat for yellow jackets Primarily, if we have a nest or a white face hornets at a school, we and that's really all we use. We use very sparingly, like Roundup or like a really strong herbicide. We'll use that around if we have a lot of weeds, like in a parking lot for some reason, you know, cracks that are coming through. But we try not to. We limit the use of that as much as we can um, in the buildings. We don't really use anything because we're we're pretty limited on how, what the law um, dictates that we can use. So we have a contract with uh, Premier Pest Control, who does our pest control. We don't treat or spray for anything ourselves at all in the schools. As needed, we'll treat, the vendor will treat for ants. Um, we'll seasonally, we'll get like flying ants that come in through a building or we get an infestation. We'll treat for that as it required. Um, rodents, well, we treat, but we use like glue traps, mm. um, no chemicals. Okay. Do you know which pre-emergent? Um, yeah, pesticides? so this year, because we had to put out a notice, so what's well, called barricade or the crabgrass preventer fertilizer the Lesco product, I can give you the sheet, we have it here. That's a fertilizer pre-emergent in one, is what we apply. Okay. So it's protamine, proteamine, I think is the main chemical. You're gonna, um, you're gonna give us that, so that five yeah. minutes? Okay. Yeah. Great, thank you. Um, and then we use what's called uh, Escalate 2, is a selective herbicide for dandelions and other weeds as needed. We don't treat the whole field for that. Like that's a spot treatment as needed. The escalate is for spot treatments? Yeah. Okay. I love these names they get up. They come up with all the weird names, yeah. They're certainly weird. I don't they know that's the name of a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
So only the high school, don't we? Else. Primarily, yeah. yeah. No, okay. we don't treat any of the other schools as a broad treatment. We have a contract for True Green who treats the high school athletic field. So the main stadium and the practice fields in the back. We contract with them. Um, our grounds foreman has a pesticide license as well. So he's the applicator if we use anything anywhere else. But if he's using like an herbicide in parking lots and stuff, he's the liar. So True Green are the, is the company that um, applies the barricade and escalate. Correct. Okay. I think they used to be called Camelon, if I'm not mistaken. Wrong. Maybe, maybe, maybe a long time ago. Who right? does the JFK fields? Because those are pretty expensive. We don't treat them. Really? No, we just see. No. They have no dandelions. So I was wondering. Yeah, there's a lot of other weeds out there. <laughs> <laughs> so you uh, mow them, but you don't treat at all? Not at JFK. Sweet. Not right now. No. We're, we're looking at renovating those fields, like that's a broad project in the city, renovating the baseball field and getting it uh, a little back online. A lot of the high school sports are starting to expand and use those fields more. So we're, we're looking at doing full irrigation out there, kind of making those more playable. But right now we're just seeding it. So we mow and then we have a overseeder that we bought, you know, a big commercial size overseeder that we use there and everywhere else in the city. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But the high school is really the premier field. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's why we have irrigation there. That's why yeah. we're treating it. Uh, that's where all the varsity sporting events are taking place. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and the JV. But, and, but as Tony says, there is some spillover. And also as, as REC continues to expand throughout the city, uh, we have a working relationship with DAM for using more and more of the school fields uh -huh. after school uh -huh. um, and then there's a relationship between us and parks and cemetery out of the dpw for maintenance of those fields the non-high school fields uh -huh. at different times of the year so it's, but the high school field is, is really the one that's getting 80 percent of the treatment uh -huh. and what about playgrounds nothing used in playgrounds so, yeah, as far as what it built. Any herbicidal treatment? Any? No. No, only thing we like use is a bee spray if there's a yellow jacket nest or more nests that impact students. And yeah. then what do you do after you've sprayed it? Do you. Uh... The nest? Yeah. Um, well, it depends <coughs> if they fall or not. There's one yeah. Right there. yeah. Yeah, there's one right here. <laughs> it's a demo. You can have listening to find yeah, out. Yeah, right. <laughs> You know, yellow jackets will be like brown nests. A lot of them are in the ground, so we just leave them. The, the spray will kill them. If they're in trees, we'll try to take the nest down. Mm -hmm. but. Do you mark the spot and you know try to keep the kids away from from it? Um, yeah, for a little while. The principals are told, and, and they're all pretty aware. Like if there's a yellow jacket yeah. nest, yeah. And the two green people have a protocol to advise. <laughs> public when they spray? True doesn't spray. Oh. Well, we spray if we use a bee spray with oh. our own staff. Okay, but um, when they fertilize? When they fertilize, yeah. Okay. If we need to. So we do it off season or when there's no school or during vacations mm -hmm. where there's no use for five days. This year we, we had to do it where we didn't have a time period like that. So the state mandates a written protocol. So we have a written notice that goes out, and this is an example of what that is. It lists, you know, the EPA registration number, the chemicals, and like the data sheets. So we post that like on the school department website, and then a robocall call went out about when the fields were treated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard some parents uh, complaining about that. Um, Hi, have a seat. Yeah. This was one of the first years we've done that. Uh -huh. We normally don't have to because if there's a five day period between use and it's during the vacation, right. that's when we've typically been able to do it. Right. This year we couldn't, the athletic schedule was too complicated. Mm -hmm. Spring rain and, and just mud and things, so the schedule got too dense. Right. So um, a while back, I think it was 2012, there was an article the newspaper about, um, I think, uh, 
<coughs> that's live carried it. Um, in the Gazette also about how the, the Northampton schools were out of compliance with state pesticide laws. Were, were you around then? I was not. <laughs> okay. I came in uh, 2015. Uh, okay. Um, so so um, you're not aware of no, no, what no. the infractions were and what how no. they were corrected. Okay. No knowledge of that. How about you, Dave? Do you know? I've been here since I was seven, but it's, it's not ringing a bell at all. Stoney said you have the grounds for it, you license, mm -hmm. and, you do, and we contract out for a lot of the work. So I'm not sure. I'd have to see the article. Mm -hmm. So um, getting back to the bee spray, if you find a nest, I mean, do you do you keep these chemicals you know, somewhere? Uh, do you have a central depository? Or do you um, just it's like aerosol can. So, so you have, you there are cans that are yeah, stored in our ground shop. We in have the ground, ground shop on Prospect Street. Behind the survival center, yep. the property yep. back there is where our stuff is stored. Yeah. Okay. So if somebody at one of the schools finds an, a bee's nest, they know to go over there to pick up the no, can, no, or do no, they no. call they, somebody? They contact us. They call you yeah. and they, they ask contact me, or they contact one of our ground people directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're the ones that do it. Okay. And um, I just have one more question, and then I'll um, turn it over to my fellow committee members here. Um, <clears throat> Uh, but if I could remember what my question was, then I would ask it. Um, but given that I've just forgotten what it is, <laughs> it'll you, come back. You know, yeah. It'll come back. But do you, do you guys have? Yeah. I have a question. What is that spray that you use for the wasp? Yeah. It's called Sting X. It's like <laughs> the another name, name, another one Sting of them. Yeah, you can have a copy of this. Awesome. So, another, yeah, catchy name. So that's when the wasps use yeah. that. Is that information recorded anywhere? Like when it was used? Where do you keep your records of? Now, uh, when, when we use the bee spray, no, we don't keep track of that. Sorry. Other question? Yeah. Sorry. So there's been a push, and part of what is driving our questions in our committee to um, around play fields to uh, to use more organic uh, methods and I'm wondering you know what what thoughts you know the city has had on that around uh, this you know any of the play fields that you guys are in charge of none you know we haven't discussed that as a method for the high school fields as okay. of yet no all right Well, it's kind of out of your hands if contractors are doing it. Well, tubing. we dictate what happens and how it happens, right? But yeah, it's contracted. Which chemicals they use? Well, they suggest to us what chemicals they're going to use to treat the need on the field. They've been doing it for a number of years, so we try to use as little as possible to control mm -hmm. what we need to. Mm -hmm. I mean, the grass, if you go down there, it's pretty good shape. There's not a lot of weeds. So we don't really do a lot of treatment for weeds. A lot of it is just fertilizer. Mm -hmm. Keep the grass growing, keep it green. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, we will have discussions with them about, you know, hey, this is a school grounds, you know, and we want to know what the state of the art is right now versus what it was, let's say, 15 years ago. Um, and that's part of our expectations is to learn from them what they're using and to expect that what they're going to be using is as benign and as green as they can use and still get the job done but also meet regulations and how how often do you question them about that the things you just mentioned every treatment they give us a report of what's applied yeah. and we know ahead of time what they're going to apply and when it's seasonal so you know early spring and then throughout the year mm -hmm. Do you think it changes much year to year that they use? Probably not. I don't think so. Recently, no. I think going back a number of years, yes. I think chemicals have gotten more advanced and different, and different in what they can treat selectively. Yeah. Got more advanced. So it's not killing grasses. So they can not affect the grass, but just target the weed. I think that's gotten certainly better. 
And has there been any discussion about um, discontinuing the use of any of these chemicals and just converting over to organic management? Not a, no. not a heartfelt discussion yet, I don't know. No. But in light of, you know, the issue of pollinators and, you know, what we're trying to, we're starting to do on the side of Crafts Avenue here, you know, what we're doing at Pulaski Park, um, that's all certainly part of the discussion we'll be having as far as how, how we're promoting as much of this as we can while still addressing the issues that need to get addressed. Okay, so um, do you have other school related questions? Yeah. Well, it, that's just a follow up on that. What, is, what are you learning because we have these, these new pollinator gardens that, and I imagine we're not using all of these traditional methods. Right. Um, what are we learning from that that might be transferable or you haven't? I think it's still new enough, Jim. I think, you know, we're, we're the one on Crafts Avenue has been in since October. Mm -hmm. Same with, with Pulaski Park. Uh, the Senior Center just did a rain garden expansion this weekend. So that will be another lab area we can now look at. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we are planning to complete the rest of the Crafts Avenue Hill next month. We'll pull out all the turf that's there and basically run that pollinator bed all the way to the, the back where the EV chargers are. Um, but what we've done so far has been amazingly successful. Mm -hmm. Look at the uh, number of pollinators and, and uh, the bee activity and the butterfly activity. Just you just to helped one out the door. Was that? You just helped I one just, out the door. That was amazing. Redirected <laughs> all the crap out. Was that a bee or a wasp? Um, that you I think that was a yellow jet. Yeah, that was a wasp. It's been nasty. Yeah. He was ready. He didn't seem he to didn't. pissed off. He was <laughs> outnumbered. He took the ride. Mm. Uh, however, they do pollinate wasps. Really? Yeah. Yeah. yeah a, a follow so the turf over at Pulaski Park, that is managed organically or is that, or do we subcontract for that? Is that, is that being handled differently? I, I would defer to Director Lascalia for that question. Okay. <laughs> it's not a term, though. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a no. I, I don't know. You we don't think that's, that's all that's the that's not part So that's all. not okay. within the purview. No. Um, but it's also being managed by local harmony. Uh huh. And all their volunteers. The turf is, or the pollinator garden. The pollinator uh, garden. Just the pollinator garden. Yeah. yeah so I can certainly address okay. the turf. Okay. So um, is this a good time to uh, turn our attention over to what else central services do? Sure. So this is much easier because uh, if you think about the city building, so the non-school building, uh -huh. so you know, police station, two fire stations, the core buildings in, in the quad here, mm -hmm. there's not any if minimal lawn area. Mm -hmm. We have some shrub areas. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be this much grass area where we do some plantings around the buildings, but we're not talking 40 acres of land, which is what we have all around the schools. Mm -hmm. So it's much, much different focus. Mm -hmm. So the grounds, I'm sorry, the maintenance crews on the city side, we do plantings for what grass there is. They will use a um, lime treatment you know, with a spreader. That's the extent of any fertilization work that they do. They maintain the flower beds, so you know bark mulch and plantings at various times of the year. And then in the interior of the buildings, similar to what we do in the schools, we have a contract with Premier, uh, who we've had for years and years, and they'll come in and they'll deal with you know, traps for, for rodent activity uh, every once in a while because of the the base that the senior center sits on, it's a very sandy soil. Uh, we'll get uh, ant infestations around the perimeter of the senior center. Mm -hmm. uh, so we'll bring pre Premier in for their standard controls. Um, so again, just like the schools, we sub that out. Um, and we're, because of the, uh, you know, the public spaces we're using is having Premier use as green products as we can. Uh, but it's a lot less activity if there's no lawn, there's no landscaping per se, um, as opposed to what we've got with the 48 acres of the schools. Mm -hmm. so it's, it's much different 
um, protocol system that we're using. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, do you have any written material for us to uh, include in our minutes? Or? I will, will get you okay. a premiere for both the city and, and the, uh, the school buildings. Okay. I'll get you their full list of uh, sort of equivalent MSDS sheets. Exactly. I'll send those over Perfect. to you. And do they uh, report to you how much they use in a given year? Um, no, they will send us with their invoice. They'll send us a treatment report mm -hmm. uh, that explains what, what the, why they were called, what the issue was, and then what the treatment was. And in some cases, um, was it, it might have been Memorial Hall last year, we had a, uh, a rodent problem. Right, all the rain we had in the fall, it was driving the little boogers inside the building. Mm. So we did a multi-month uh, trapping and assessment program with Premier for them. So they weren't treating each time, but they were coming in, let's say, once a month or once every couple of weeks to check their traps, move the traps as needed based on evidence they were seeing. And then when spring came, situation disappear. And these are glue traps only? Or? Yes. So if, uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Yeah. So in terms of the work that Premier does, is it on an as-needed basis or is it that, you know, they come in at routine times to apply <laughs> certain uh, products? It's both. So in the case of the ants at the senior center, they would recommend, let's say, five treatments spread over a two month period and I'll contract with them and they'll be there five times. Problem disappear, we don't need them anymore. Okay. Same with the roads at Memorial Hall. Once the problem was, was taken care of, you know, they say, look, we're done. We're not going to, we don't need to go back anymore. So it's as needed or if it's just an ongoing situation until the problem is resolved. And the schools is almost, almost entirely as needed. In my rodents, you're talking about the old mice, I'm guessing. Yeah, we're talking a little bit bigger critters, too. Really? Yes. Okay. Other questions? So if the city um, said to you, the city council in this case said to you, uh, we would like you to stop using pesticides or drastically reduce it, what would you do? We would ask for a significant increase to our budget to support that. Going organic will be much more costly and much more labor intensive than what we're currently doing. And we don't know that it's all as, as effective either. So we'd have to really study that uh, more and get more information. Mm -hmm. We're really truly trying to keep. You know, the stadium field is kind of a showcase field. You know, we have one of the nicest grass fields in probably Western Mass. So for, you know, any of the sports, the varsity sports that play there, um, yeah, it's important that we keep it in good, top quality condition. Mm -hmm. So if, uh, if it's one of the best fields in the area, then that must mean that most teams are playing on fields that are not quite as gorgeous or perfect. So, um, um, what benefit is there to having a gorgeous field if the teams can play on, on some, you know, some dandelions and some other weeds? What's the benefit of having a perfect field? Well, it's more than just the grass. Mm -hmm. It's the substructure. It's the levelness of the field. It's the fact that it's, it's crowned properly so the water sheds. Mm -hmm. uh, there's, a, there's a lot more than just sitting in the stands and seeing that nice green look. Right, so, but none of those things that you just mentioned involve pesticides. No, okay. but it's a lot of maintenance. Yeah. So yeah, seeding, yeah. Okay. fertilizing, you've got to hold that field together. Right. So it's all part of the mix. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, uh, and personally, it's I think Tony feels the same way. That, my feeling is that that field in the high school should stay as a turf field and not a synthetic field. There is a movement to go to a synthetic field, no. but you're talking literally millions of dollars yeah. over the lifespan of that field. 
which you know, let's think about where you want to spend our money. Exactly. Yeah. It is a beautiful field as it now exists, and that's also due to the tremendous effort by three person grounds crew uh -huh. that maintains that field. Mm -hmm. So we'll put a package together. How should we get the information to you? Uh, you can send it directly to me. Or we, we now have a new uh, Gmail address for our committee that you could send it to, okay. which is uh, Northampton Pesticide Reduction at gmail.com. All one word, Bill. All one word, no punctuation. Pesticide Reduction at Gmail. Yep. Okay. We will put a package together scan this over to you and certainly follow up with us if you need any additional information mm -hmm. as, you're mm -hmm. the, as you're moving forward. Yeah. I'll give you this stuff. Yeah, thank now. you very much. Uh, we can scan that in and attach it to our minutes. Thank you. Thank you. No thank you for your thank time. You so I really appreciate it. Nice you. Good to see you. Yeah. Sorry about the lack of uh, refreshments. Thanks, time. <laughs> we need you. They bring Danish coffee. We'll add it to our, our, our budget request. Yeah. Thank you. See you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Dr. Scalia, you? DPW. Yes, uh, welcome. Thank you. Um, do you uh, shall we introduce ourselves to you? We are the Pesticide Reduction Committee. Okay. My name is Adele Franks. I am chairing this committee. Uh, Cynthia Swopis. Uh, Vice Chair, Secretary, and I'm on the Board of Health. Jim Nash, Ward 3 City Councilor. And Kate Simmons, our Environmental Chemist. Yeah, very good. And Elisa Klein is a member of our committee, but she was not here today. Okay. So. Welcome. Thank you for your time. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. So tell us about what areas of the city the DPW does maintenance on that um, might pertain to pesticide use? And we, just to make sure it's clear, the pesticides includes herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, rodenticides, everything, all, all sides. Yeah, I'll start by saying that we don't use any herbicides, insecticides on any parks or recreation fields, Pulaski Park, nothing. We are 100% organic. So there is no uh, grub control, there's no synthetic fertilizers, there's you know, none of that stuff that you uh, spray on your lawn and turn it like fluorescent green. Um, it is 100% organic. And that's a transition that's gone on probably over the past three years. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but I just wanted to kind of lead with that. That's probably a little known fact um, that, that everything we do is 100% organic. Um, there's good things and bad things associated with that. Yeah, we'd love to hear more about that, but sure. uh, you specified that was parks and recreation fields. Parks, recreation, cemeteries, anything that's green, we do not chemicals on it in our forestry parks and sanitary operation so no chemicals and, and uh, just to understand the expanse you also plow or, or put chemicals on the roads or? roadway salt Road, I mean, okay. that's, yeah that, that's that's like snow and ice control gotcha. it's, uh, that kind of is what it is and, and you know, it's not classified as a pesticide. pesticide or herbicide. It kills snow. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we do have uh, a couple of things that we need to use um, chemicals for. Um, one of them is tree root control in the sewer system. We have to inject a foaming root killer into the sewer lines. Um, and then we have a blade that it kind of pushes the, the foaming root control is, is kind of the lay term for it. So it, it sort of pushes the substance through the sewer lines. You know, mm. tree roots love sewer lines and the longer the sewer lines in the ground, the more mm. opportunity there is for a tree root to sort of get into where the joints are, you know, the, 
the joints of the pipe can sort of degrade over time and you never really notice it until that tree root starts to infiltrate and tree roots are really the number one cause of sanitary sore backups um, which can negatively impact people's homes mm -hmm. um, definitely happens more than we would like um, so we have an annual program when we move around the city, we have a contractor come in and insert this piece of machinery into the sewer system and, and just blow this, um, this root killer right through the... Uh, and what is the root killer? Um, it's, a, it's called, bear with me here, um, it's called Razo Rooter 2. Razo Rooter. Razo Rooter 2, that really common <laughs> trade name. Um, the active ingredient is diquat dibromide. Yeah, diquat. 37.3%. So this is approved for use in our sewer system. And, and this is one of these things like there is no option. It is what it is. You want the sewage to flow. This is what we need to do to keep the sewage flowing. Hmm. You know, every time there's a sewer claim for the city, it's thousands and thousands of dollars. And it's, um, you know, really the culprit is typically tree roots. And they grow faster than we would like. Hmm. So that's one kind of little known place where we where we do have to do this. Um, and do you mind if I just ask a question about that particular um, application? Sure. So what happens, at, so then you, you phone this stuff and you push it through, yeah. and then how do you know if the tree roots are gone? We camera it. You camera it. Yeah. And then um, the place where the tree roots have gone into the sewer system, uh, th there must be gaps there. Yeah, I mean, we can see that there is infiltration happening. I mean, that's undesirable for many reasons. First of all, because there's a tree root in the pipe, but secondly, because that now allows groundwater to get into the sewer system, and that increases our flows at the wastewater treatment plant, which is very problematic because now we're treating groundwater, um, which is just a huge waste of time and money. Um, so we do have a whole camera assembly. We have a specialized what man that's all set up with this camera mm -hmm. and we can see there's places where there has been this infiltration happening so now that means you know we're going to have infiltration of groundwater so then we would target this particular area for removal and replacement of, oh, the, of the sewer main. and then when the this chemical gets to the sewer treatment plant what happens to it it's just processed and, and goes out into the river it, it goes through our treatment process so it goes through you know our clarifiers and our aeration it has chlorine applied to it. Um, you know, we have very strict effluent limits. We, we cannot discharge in excess of what our permit says we can discharge. You know, this, this chemical that's used is EPA approved. We're able to, I mean, basically we are removing pollution from the water. It's the water pollution control facility. So, you know, there's a lot of things that people flush down the toilet that are really horrible for the river, and we have the ability to remove those things mm -hmm. from the waste stream before they're discharged into the river. So we're very careful about what are we actually putting in the pipes to control these tree roots because, like, we're going to have to deal with it on this end, and if it was forcing us out of compliance with our permit, um, that's a really big deal, and we obviously wouldn't do something like that. So what we are using is the least impactful product to get most bang for our buck, if you will, um, and not create problems for us on the other end. And I will mention we have very strict limits in our permit. I mean, it's not negotiable. We test every single day. If our effluent quality is not where it's supposed to be, you know, we get like um, layered in paperwork from EPA and DEP and no one wants that. Um, so, I mean, we, but we're not like fully ground here. I mean, this is, this is very serious and anything we put into our system, we need to be able to take it out right? and, and we can't, and that's why we use this product. Uh -huh. Okay, thank you. So, so the, the, the foam kills the roots that then allows this blade to come through. The, my question is, could the blade go through without the roots being killed? Well, the roots will just come back. Oh, okay, so it's, I got it. Yeah, so the blade is turning as the, uh, as the razor rooter is being applied. Got so it's it. doing oh, okay. something, you know, it's stung, you know, it's, it's basically like killing that end of the root. It's, it's just, like painting it's, the root so it doesn't. They, yeah, it's like burning it right off and, okay. and it grows somewhere else that we want it to grow instead of into our sore pipe.
But, you know, we have 160 miles of sewer pipes. I mean, that's a huge liability for the city. Um, you know, I mean, I've been in people's basements when there's been a sanitary sewer overflow. It's really horrible. It's not nice. Yeah, not nice at all. Yeah, I'm not so sure they can see that at the wastewater treatment plant. Like, they're monitoring for diquat. I mean, it's so diluted. I mean, we're doing five million gallons. Right. Day, you know, by the time it gets there, it may not even exist by the yeah, time it gets it's there. It's so diluted. Right. There's, there's nothing even there. And I, I think I know the answer to this, but we don't have this issue with the stormwater system. No, because there's no, there's no, no yeah, there's no like uh, nutrients, if you will. I mean, there are certainly nutrients in stormwater, but right. they're not that attractive to triggers. I mean. It's it's like it's, instant, it's, sewer it's like instant fertilizer, yeah. you know. I mean, it's it's why you put manure in your garden; it makes everything grow. You know, it's, it's kind of the same concept. Um, I'm good, but maybe I could just ask the uh, the spelling of diquat. D i q a t. Uh, go hold on. D i oh. yeah D i q u a t. I'm sorry. That's, oh wow, okay. that's what I meant. Q a t o t. Yeah, and the, the rotor rooter, the razor rooter too, is actually a process that includes. No, it's a no. it's a product. Oh, it, it is a product. Yeah, it's, it's a combination product. of okay. diquat and dibromide. Okay, and uh, you're going to give us the handout. That I'll give you the spec sheet if you'd like it. Sure. Thanks. No problem. Um, the other thing we do is we um, we have to uh, institute rodent control procedures. Um, we have sore rats. Oh. They get into people's houses. Not into a yeah, yeah. So um, they get into the wastewater plant. They particularly get into the neighborhood around the wastewater treatment plant. Um, so we have to control them. We control them with a product called Contract, C O N T R A C. Um, and the active ingredient in that is bromadiolone, B R O M A D I O L O N E. These are packets. You put them into manholes. You place them around the wastewater plant. Um, there are no other options, so this is what we use. And what that kills them? It's yes. A, yes, it's like this straight out death. Mm -hmm. um, and these are not like friendly little field mice. Those are sore rats, rats, and there's a difference. So. Um, so anyway, we just want to make sure that people don't get unexpected visitors in their houses, yards. Um, we had an issue on Monroe Street earlier this year. We had a little bit of an infestation down there. I mean, you just never really know where they're going to pop up. I mean, we we really try to avoid doing this, but it, it just kind of is the nature of the business. Mm -hmm. it's, it's a sore and there's rats. Mm -hmm. So anyway, those are those are kind of the two um, sewer wastewater related issues. Um, you know, obviously we don't like using these types of products. Um, there, there is no alternatives that we are aware of. You know, it's not feasible to put most traps in a sewer system. Or have cats everywhere. Yeah, yeah, right. What's that book? It's like the cat ate the rat, and then they right. brought in dogs to eat the cats, and then they brought in something else to eat the dogs. I don't remember. And they ended oh, up the with, house to check, though. They, they ended up yes. with rats at the end of the Yeah, party, right. You know? So, I, I mean, there's, there is really no alternatives to this. I mean, people expect the sewer system to work, and this is what we need to do to make it work. So, there's probably like one of these really inglorious things that the DPW is in charge of. And, you know, it's uh, not something I talk about a lot, except when I mm -hmm. appear in front of a committee like mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so anyway, that's the sewer system. Um, I can talk a little bit about the work we just did on the levees, because maybe that's on your mind. Um, we are under very strict requirements from the Army Corps of Engineers to control vegetation on our levee system, which is miles long. Um, most of it we are able to mow. We have to mow it and keep the grass at a certain length so that Army Corps can do like a visual inspection. So this is sort of problematic. There's a group that's um, very fond of monarch butterflies and they don't want us to mow the embankment and you know because it's like a monarch habitat and I mean I love monarch butterflies too but like we have rules that we have to follow. So 
again, like we have, you know, regulatory authorities who watch us very carefully, and everything we do is based on what their requirements are. Um, so we mow what we can on the levees. There are places in the levees, um, primarily in the Mill River Diversion Channel, that are riprap because the slope is very, very forbidding. The riprap holds the slope together. Um, particularly if there's like a corner, you know, if that water were to start sort of rushing through, it would very easily erode the corner, which is why you have these big rocks there. So vegetation grows on the rocks. I mean, it's just kind of like the way it is. And we can't get at it with a machine. You just, you just can't get there. We call them ankle busters, you know, like you're, you're trying to navigate, you know, and there's these huge boulders on a slope like this. So, you know, we're running a $2 million stormwater utility and we just spent $400,000 on mechanical removal of vegetation in the Mill River Diversion Channel, um, as well as, um, it, it, actually in both systems, so the Mill River System and the Connecticut River System. So we had, you know, a crane come in and remove all these trees. We had someone go through and like hand dig out, you know, what they had to or what they were able to. You know, once something has a three inch trunk or greater, Army Corps requires not only does it come out, but all the roots come out too. And then you have to do like remediation in the levee because theoretically the levee could be undermined by the roots. So this is a really big expensive deal. and you know, running a $2 million utility to spend $400,000 on mechanical removal of trees is not an insignificant amount of money. Mm -hmm. And as you know, probably from your own yard, you know, you mow the lawn and a week later it's back. So we have invasives that love these really sunny rip-wrap banks of the levees. And, you know, we have people go through and mechanically control them and like a week later, you know, here we go again. And financially, this is like not sustainable. For us, I can't spend $400,000 every year, you know, having some guy go out with a weed whacker. Uh, so what we did and what we are able to do is every six years, we can go through and do a spot application of herbicide. So this was like one guy with a backpack sprayer with glyphosate which is a heavily regulated chemical that has gotten a very bad rap because you know there's been multi-million dollar judgments against it like in California and in other states. And it was one guy with a backpack sprayer for two days doing a foliar application of this on these invasives on a very steep section of rip rap. And what this does is it kills the invasive and we all move on. And it's, it's, I mean, the guy didn't even have a mask on. He had no protective gear on. It was, it was done under the, uh, there was an inspector from the Mass Department of Agriculture there. You know, we had multiple permits for this. It's a chemical that is approved for use in our waterways. So it, it was a very limited one-time application of this particular product to control a very specific product if uh, if we decided that we weren't going to do this sort of vegetation control like if, if we were just going to say okay we need to manage you know invasives by hand you know or get some special machine you're looking at increasing the value of the utility exponentially so if that's a direction that the city wanted to go in I would say I need another half a million dollars a year and I can hire a whole team of contractors and they can go in there all summer long and pick these things up by hand. Because you pick them out and they're back, you know, I mean that's the nature of an invasive. There's no known, um, not predators isn't the right word, but you know. You Invaders. Just, yeah, I mean you just can't kill So them. every six years that's enough to keep it at bay? It, I mean it's not preferable but what this was done six years ago because if you do it more frequently you actually need a vegetation management plan which is a whole process unto itself there's like public hearings and public process so this is like what national grid has they have a vegetation management plan where they say you know we're going to come through every september we're going to spray you know this area with this product with this many gallons of product and 
so on and so forth. So that's not something the city has. That's not something I'm interested in the city having. I'm not interested in the frequent use of herbicides. We do what we can to control this manually. We'll keep an eye on the riprap section. It is my hope that this application has solved our problem and we can all move on. But again, if this was something that the city said, you know, we're never going to use herbicide on the levy again, then we need to have a very serious conversation <coughs> about how we are going to reconfigure the utility to add a significant amount of money, like six figures, to it to fund this endeavor. Because Army Corps wants the vegetation at a certain level. On the riprap, they want nothing. Mm -hmm. You know, so we control what we can control, where we can control it, but there's just some places we can't get to. So that's just some commentary on the levees, and again, very heavily, heavily regulated. I mean, I think we had like six or seven permits and an inspector from the state. Wow. It, you know, which is really ironic if you think about it. You can go to Home Depot and buy as much Roundup as you can take use in your car you and throw it into the air in the middle of downtown. And there is no one and nothing that will stop you. That's right. And you know, we want to do a very targeted application in a very specific place you know, for a very specific reason. And the regulatory hoops that we had to jump through and then like, actually having an inspector standing there like this you know, watching this licensed applicator, you know, spray it onto a little leaf, you know, I, I mean, that was actually what this was. This is not helicopter spraying. This is, you know, a guy with a backpack sprayer. So, so it's not DPW that does the actual spraying. No, it's no we contracted, contracted a, so we had a <coughs> specialized contractor came in from New York State. It's all these people do. Oh, how big was that area? It was the Mill River Diversion Channel, so it's probably, you know, grand total, maybe half a mile or something. Um, but very... It took one guy two days. It took one guy two days because he had a walk. Like, yeah. he couldn't walk. Yeah. That was, yeah. That, yeah, that was, I mean, if it was like on a flat surface, he would have been done in an hour, you know, but it was just the terrain was right. really, really difficult, yeah. so. It was, and he came from New York every morning, so by the time, like, he got there and you know, linked his way up and down the river out. Um, hmm. It was a two-day operation. Hmm. Yeah. But that's why, you know, there was there was a little bit of publicity around this when it happened. And I just can't stress to people, like, like you can actually go to Home Depot and, and buy cases of Roundup that fill this room. You can, you can, you know, my mother can. It's, it's just kind of uh, hi, come on, man. hi, <laughs> Yeah, so I, I just want to say around the uh, application on the levy, DPW did a great job of notifying people, and the information that you supplied to me and neighbors was terrific. <coughs> also, in terms of you know helping people understand that this has to do with making sure that the levy system is certified because that's actually related to uh, property insurance, that if the dike isn't certified, almost half of downtown now has to get flood insurance. Mm -hmm. So the, the, um, so that's the, the other end of the, um, the, the, the scale that DPW is weighing um, is in terms of you know, what, um, what, they're, what they're gonna do to take care of vegetation on the dike. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and the, the soonest we could do something like this again, and the something would be exactly what we just did, would be six years because we lack this vegetation management plan, mm -hmm. which we have no plans to pursue. Mm -hmm. And, you know, who knows, maybe there's some sort of different machine six years from now that we, you know, some sort of like big hydraulic sidearm or something that we could, you know, throw over onto the riprap bank and just knock this stuff down. And, they make some really cool machinery. You know, the problem is it's riprap. You know, if, if this were a, a smooth slope, I'd have a little more option. I just don't really have an option on the riprap. So our best option is just to kill this stuff at the roots and 
move on. I mean, eventually it comes back, but it's it's going to take it a while. Mm -hmm. um, so I I just wanted to cover that because I know that you knew that we had that we had done some work and there was a little bit of publicity around that, but it's a very very isolated and very particular reason. So. Um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, what we're doing on the athletic fields and parks. So we're maintaining hundreds of acres of cemeteries, parks, recreation fields. It's, as I mentioned, 100% organic. Um, we use cultural practices like aeration and overseeding um, with, a Kentucky, with a Kentucky bluegrass mix of at least 30%. So Kentucky bluegrass is like a really prolific grower. It like, keeps rooting itself. So like strawberries, I don't know if you've ever grown strawberries, and they just keep like rooting and rooting and rooting. Um, so that's why we use Kentucky bluegrass. Um, we mow at a higher height, you know, instead of having, you know, golf course esque. It's a little more country lawn type, um, and we use organic fertilizer. And so that's everywhere, every field all across the city, every park all across the city. Um, we use uh, uh, something called nematodes that kill grubs. Um, so we use these on Florence Field. We plant them in October. That way, have the parasite that basically burrows into the grubs and kills them. Um, you know, but these things are like really—I don't want to say flaky, but they're like you can only apply them at night, and you can only apply them. You know, I don't want to say like at a full moon, but there is like very. <laughs> It's like a very particular They're application features. product. Yeah. So, you know, if you were to put them out now, they die before they did anything. You know, so like there's, and this is really what I want to stress, like there is a significant cost to doing what we are doing. We're using corn gluten to prevent crabgrass instead of the stuff you buy at Home Depot and just throw it around and like your crabgrass goes away. Um, we use something called vinegreen, which is just a vinegar solution to control weeds. You know, it's not as effective as Roundup. I mean, it's it, it just isn't. You know, it's it's like an all natural alternative to vinegar. So that means we need to buy more of it, and we need to apply it more often, and we need to apply it under really controlled circumstances. You could go out in a rainstorm and throw Roundup down, and it kills everything. Well, vinegreen, like you want to do it right now. You know, because like if it rains, it's like Spilling, yeah, it's like spilling vinegar on your counter and you wash it off, you know, so it's, it's kind of that sort of dynamic. Um, you know, one of the things that's, or several of the things, and you can probably speak to this more so than I can, um, but typical fertilizers contain really high volumes of phosphorus, potassium, and urea, which contaminates waterways. So you get this, you know, fertilizer runoff phenomenon, which creates algae blooms, so interestingly, when we look at our wastewater treatment plant permit, which is about to be reissued by EPA, everyone's gonna have nitrogen limits because Long Island Sound is completely contaminated by nitrogen. I mean, there's many reasons for this, but fertilizer runoff is definitely a big part of that. But you know what? Nitrogen makes everything green. And you know, everyone loves how a nice green field looks, but it also like makes things grow in the water. Um, so, you know, we're very mindful of all of this, so we do what we can to create an environment where the grass is gonna thrive, but you're not gonna see that beautiful fluorescent green lawn. And interestingly, there was a study of my department done before I was the director, so back in 2015, and one of the things that the study said was like, the fields look horrible. And, you know, it, it, I don't want to say the fields are horrible. I mean, but the fields are not perfect. And the fields are not perfect for a reason. Um, because it takes chemicals to make the fields perfect. So, you know, we use organics to try to feed the soil, enhance nutrient activity. You know, you spray miracle grow on a plant that makes the plant grow. You use organics. You enrich the soil, and then the soil makes the plant grow. So it's there's sort of patience. You know, there's and, and there's cultural practices, and what I will say is this stuff is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's expensive. The products are expensive, but most importantly, the labor is expensive. So every you know, and I can't necessarily quantify and say, wow, this is taking three times as long. 
But what I will tell you is this is general fund money. We have a very limited budget. I mean, we're running the entire parks, forestry, and cemetery operation on $276,000 a year. That is not a lot of money for, for the amount of acres we are controlling and for what the public expects of us. $90,000 of that we're spending on seed and fertilizer. And I have people working seven days a week not 24 hours a day, but many, many evenings at time and a half. Anything after three o'clock is time and a half. So there is a significant cost to doing what we are doing. So when I come before city council and say, you know, I need an increase in my budget. Well, there's a reason I need an increase in my budget because if we're out there throwing grubex around or if we're out there throwing crabgrass killer around or, you know, let me get the bag of 10, 10, 10 and just, you know, run it off. Like, this is much easier, it's much cheaper, it's much faster. You know, you do it once and, and you're done. So, this is short right. sighted. So, so I, why would the uh, switch made three years ago? I, I mean, primarily just an awareness that this is, I mean, this is harmful, you know, this is not, um, this is not like. I mean, it might actually be industry best practices, but this is not really the direction that we want the DPW to go. Um, we feel that it, you know, really, like, when I talk about sewer rats, like, I don't have an option, you know, but do we have an option with Albert Field? And the answer is, yeah, we do. I mean, remember, when Florence Field opened, it was all organic, so that was before I arrived there. So then the question was, you know, can we actually transition to that in the rest of the city? And we have moved in that direction. I've been able to work with the mayor and increase the funding. But again, this is general fund money, and it's not glorious. I mean, this is not sexy. This is not, you know, more police and firefighters. It's not even more personnel for the DPW. I mean, it's actually just taking the people you have and now they work 60 hours a week but it's not attractive for me to show up at city council and say well i need to buy some corn gluten and you know like it costs fifteen thousand dollars you know so therefore you need to vote for that i mean it's it's not like uh you know it's just not really glorious and there's all these sunk costs associated with doing what we're doing i mean we're doing it but if we ever get to a place where we need to start making some decisions or we need to cut or something it, you know there's a lot of money here and is charles park included in your purview we no we are not um, we are not responsible for charles park it's private yeah so uh okay so uh, we don't know uh do we know who takes care of charles park who does maintenance there i don't know okay i happen to know okay so we'll i will we'll, we'll ask you later um, other questions? How many acres of uh, parks and cemeteries and fields do you oversee? Um, I'll get you an exact number. It's, okay. uh, it's about 90 acres of cemeteries. Um, parks, it's hundreds. Hundreds, right. Yeah. yeah, I'll get you an exact number. Okay. Quite a balancing act you're performing. Mm. Every day. Every well, there day. is. I think the question you need to ask is, what is absolutely non-negotiable for the public here? You know, mm -hmm. like rats in your basement are not something you want. Like, there's no tolerance for that. Mm -hmm. And if, well, you know, I'm trying to like relocate them, or you know, <laughs> yeah. I, don't think, yeah. I don't know wants to hear about that. So really. I mean, just across the board when I'm done the department, that's the sort of things I have to think about. Like, what is, what do I absolutely have to do? There's, there's you know, some things you just got to do whether you want to do them or not. And then there's some things where you have a little more flexibility. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for your commitment, though, to, to this. Mm -hmm. It's really amazing. Yeah. yeah, it's reassuring to know that you're at the helm. Yeah. No, it's, it's good. I mean, I get great staff, great superintendents in place, and, and really intelligent people who thoroughly research things and, you know, understand, like, the big picture. You know, it would be a lot easier, you know, Rich Parcelletti, I'm sure you guys know him, is the, the superintendent of this division, and he's very, very knowledgeable about all of these processes, and, and he's really the one who said, you know what, I think we can do this. 
and yeah, I give him a lot of credit for making this happen. But it is important for everyone to understand, like, this is a real feel-good story, but dot, 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 you know, and, and there is a but. Yeah, and the city council needs to be aware of that. Um, Particularly because it's general fund money and, you know, the, the forestry, parks, and sanitary budget is not, like, interest. You know, I don't, I don't mean interesting, but it's just not, like, this real glorious thing you know it's 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 more of a um you know it, it, it's it's not like uh snow and ice you know we gotta do it or or potholes like we gotta do it you know this is a little it's a little extra if you will and if you emphasize that it's the extra is for the organic management i'm sure our city council will be very sympathetic yeah i this this is actually better than I expected. I mean, I was expecting good news from DPW around the, the way we care for our properties. And, and it's also based on discussions with Mr. Par Parasoletti. Did I say his name right? Parasoletti. Parasoletti. Yeah. And, that, um, and that I know that, yeah, the Florence Fields discussion really, you know, prompted some rethinking um, across the city, you know, both for citizens and, and for the city. and. That uh, Mr. Parasoletti, you know, he he's really helped inch us towards these changes, and it's uh, it's it's pretty cool. So this was part of the good news I was expecting to come out, but yeah, I, it, this it, is even better. It so really you. comes down to money. You know, you can have all the great ideas in the world, but if it, you know, if you say, okay, I have a finite amount of funds, and I need to maintain X amount of space, you know, so what I have to do with Rich and say, you know. This is the amount of money I can give you. What can you make happen with this? Because the public is not going to tolerate some crabgrass infested, grub infested, you know, uneven. I mean, you heard Dave Pomerantz allude to this. You know, grubs eat the grass and cause potholes. And then you've got, you know, kids running around playing soccer and someone falls over because they've hit this grub infested section of the field and like that's a big deal and and the public is not going to tolerate that no matter how good our intentions are like it's it's just sure. not acceptable yeah. so what we have to do you know what i have to do is work with the mayor to get the appropriate level of funding and then say to rich can you make this work and that's you know a good relationship that all of us have and we've been very successful and very proud of what we've done you know over the past few years how much ongoing training is required there's, you know, there's CEUs for your pesticide applicator license, um, you know, which I think steer, which several people in my department have just because, you know, pesticides used to be a thing. Um, but the state is actually starting to, you know, steer towards more organic management, um, you know, and there's certainly plenty of seminars out there. And, educational programs through UMass particularly. So, you know, we avail ourselves of that to the extent possible. But again, there's a cost for everything, you know. So like if you go to seminar, it's a thousand bucks, you know, that's all coming out of the two hundred and seventy six thousand dollars. So which is really not a lot of money. I mean divide that by fifty two. That shows you, you know, what we're running every week. And if ninety thousand dollars of that is fertilizer, it doesn't leave a lot of money for things like you know gas. If you want a lawnmower, you know, so it's I mean it's definitely a balancing act. Yeah. yeah, understood. Other questions? Just one more, and I'm not sure this is DPW, but mosquito control is that Board of Health? Board, Board of Health. Health. Yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so they know that sure. question's coming. Yeah. <laughs> so I'll leave you. Um, I'll leave you my razor rooter cut sheet and my rat killer <laughs> cut sheet. <laughs> and I'll get you the total. I, I'm sorry, I just can't recall the total number yeah, of uh, thank you. parks off oh, the top of my head. Mm -hmm. Thank you so thank much. You so much. much. Nice right. Thank you. Sure. Thank, thank you very you, much. You're up. All right. Hi, Meredith. Hi. Meredith. Hi. You can sit wherever you like. Mm -hmm.
want you to be comfortable and we want you to be within view of the camera because this this is an open meeting that's being filmed. Is that your good side? <laughs> yes, thanks. Sorry, okay. <laughs> um, let's introduce ourselves to you. My name is Adele Franks. We've met. Um, I'm chairing this committee. No, me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Thank Hearing about your use of pesticides, which includes um, all things with the word side, with the term side at the end, uh, herbicides, rodenticides, insecticides, etc. And uh, we have reason to believe that primarily you would be involved in the mosquito issues. Correct. Right. So mm -hmm. why don't you start up by telling us what you do with the sure. mosquitoes? The only side that we use is larvicide. Uh, for mosquito control currently. So um, we treat, well actually we hire a company to treat. We outsource it, it's a contractor, mosquito squad is who we use. Um, we treat all of our catch basins that are in areas where people congregate, um, high residential areas, where people may be at risk for contracting any mosquito-borne, which we call an arbor virus, disease. So we treat those catch basins three times a year and we treat our known breeding areas. So we treat the meadows, um, some standing water that we're aware of with this larvicide application, which is the BTI briquettes that we use. The BTI briquettes, um, they are active for 30 days. So we are on rotation. We, we do like, a, our schedule is like the end of April, first week of May, and then every 30 days after to get us through the season to treat the breeding areas. We don't treat for nuisance, we treat for disease. Mm -hmm. So how do you determine that treatment is needed? Well, we do a risk map. Um, again, where people congregate, so say our downtown, we make sure that we treat all of our catch basins in downtown because our catch basins have organic material in them, which is where the mosquitoes, our vector mosquitoes, like to breed in. So we look at risk maps based on land use and water. Okay, so it's not based on um, diseases that have occurred. It's prevention. It's prevention. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then how would you handle it differently if there is um, an outbreak? Sure, well, that's not, um, there's not an overarching umbrella for that, for, to answer that question. It is really dependent. So we do surveillance. Um, we're part of the uh, Pioneer Valley Mosquito Control District, and we set traps all around the city throughout the season, the mosquito season, to see what's happening, what mosquito species are in our area. And then we look at those mosquito species and we see what disease they carry. So if we start getting positive hits of these types of mosquitoes, these vectors carrying the viruses, we'll treat a little more aggressively in that area of our known breeding ground. So we'll look at where we've treated, have we missed any standing water, so on and so forth. Um, other communities that are part of um, mosquito districts may take that data and do some, um, uh, what do they call it, direct ground spraying, or depending on if we're just looking at mosquitoes carrying the virus or humans now acquiring the virus, as you see in the news, they might do, DPH might declare a public health emergency and do aerial spreading. So it's really dependent on what's going on and what your findings are. But you, uh, uh, locally, mm -hmm. only use BTI. We only use BTI right now. Mm -hmm. And again, this might be reevaluated after this season. Um, this is certainly an anomaly in terms of disease in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. I have read that um, uh, the mosquito that carries Zika has been found in Massachusetts now, so I imagine that's It's been found here in Northampton two years ago. It's the Albopectus that carries Zika and it also carries yellow fever and a whole plethora of different diseases, dengue fever. 
we tracked it over in the um, the old junkyard, uh, car junkyard on South on Route 10 right there. Can't think of the name of it. Um, South Street. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So it's here. Um, at that point, when we tracked it, we were told by DPH we don't know if it's proliferating here, if it was brought in. So more of a seasonal type of thing brought in from whatever, off a boat from an old tire or something like that, or if it's actually here and breeding here. That's yet to be determined. But it has moved its way all the way up to the northeast, and there are known pockets of where it might actually be breeding. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't discount Northampton being one of them. Mm -hmm. And um, But to date, your response to that is to simply be more aggressive with the BTI. With surveillance, doing surveillance to see if we actually have breeding here. Mm -hmm. The BTI um, doesn't target, you know, it, it doesn't affect non-targeted species from what I know. We have used, um, we, the company that we use was using other sources of larvicide, which we thought um, was a little more toxic and could affect some of the non-targeted species, so we asked them to use this. Um, again, it's 30-day active uh, active uh, shelf life, and then um, what else was there about it? I don't know. We use about 3,500 3, for cats a season. We treat our catch basins um, with about 2,500 of those briquettes, and then we treat the meadows and other known breeding sites with about 1,200 other briquettes or so, give or take. Mm -hmm. We treat it a little more aggressively this year because of what was going on. Other questions? Meredith, I just want to make sure because I'm taking minutes. Mm -hmm. um, mosquito doctor is who we use. Mosquito squad. Mosquito squad. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. <laughs> Same difference. <you> know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and are there other, um, besides mosquito control, are there any other um, insect related or herbicide related issues that the um, your department deals with? Not at all. I remember that your question as well, Alex. Uh, that's questions? a great question. I, it wasn't my question. Oh, okay. Well, mm -hmm. then you're next. Oh, oh you're next. I, I remember you saying one time, Meredith, there, there's this neighborhood, right, that calls you a lot. Mm -hmm. So there's neighbor, there's people that call and say, we have so many mosquitoes. Mm -hmm. How do you respond? So it depends when the call is coming in. Usually this neighborhood calls in late April, so spring, very wet. The mosquitoes active in that springtime, early spring, late spring time, are nuisance mosquitoes. They are usually not our vector mosquitoes. Okay. So um, there are things that you can do around your home to, to reduce um, breeding sites, you know, cleaning your gutters. We talk about things that they can do, talking to your neighbors. I mean, breed, the mosquitoes can breed in small, you know, something as small as like a quarter size little puddle. If that is standing water for 72 hours, you will get mosquito breeding. So we talk about that and we do education around that. Um, but it's very important that they know the difference between nuisance mosquitoes and vector mosquitoes. So when they call, you're not like, we're going out there and we're spraying. No. Yeah. Mm -hmm. no. And isn't it true that most active at dawn and dusk? So different mosquitoes. Oh. So the ones that carry West Nile virus are kind of day flyers and they're active and they're looking for a blood meal then, but the ones that are carry triple E are right after dusk and dawn. Mm -hmm. Between dusk and dawn. Can you swim dusk and dawn? Uh, after, sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, in the evening, into early morning. That's when they're active looking for a blood meal. Did I say that backwards? No, my That's understanding dark. was at dawn and then dusk are the times you'll encounter most mosquitoes. That was my understanding, but I don't know where I got that from. Is that true? No. Um, there are a lot of mosquitoes that are active between those periods, but we're you know, again, with disease, the disease that are known here, endemic here in Western Mass, we're considered, we take into consideration both. Mm -hmm. But you might find more, a lot more species that are more active during those times than the daytime. Okay. If that makes sense. Yes. Okay. So when you say vector mosquitoes, <clears throat> is that a particular type of mosquito or is that a mosquito that had, you know, it's a type of mosquito that's known to carry a virus? 
I mean, exactly. So there are like 250 known mosquitoes out there that have been identified. Oh right. So there are a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. But there's this subset that we're really concerned about that can pick up and carry a virus. So like our um, our West Nile virus, um, it goes. The cycle goes from bird to mosquito. So the mosquito picks it up from bird and then brings it to a human. We call that a vector mosquito. That it carries that known virus, which we're concerned about. So you're saying there are a fewer species that are actually carrying yes. disease, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, disease-related organisms. Mm -hmm. okay. The mosquito is the number one killer in the world every single year. It kills more people than anything else. This little, little flying insect. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess if you add in malaria, that would for mm -hmm. yeah. a lot of deaths. Yeah. 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 Well, we don't have malaria here yet. <laughs> so I have a question yeah. from it, it from a constituent. He emailed me last week. It had to do with a uh, a tire retailer, and that um, this the right now with the concern about the mosquitoes breeding in old tires. Is are there protocols that people are supposed to be following? Um, in terms of storing old tires, mm -hmm. uh, do you guys go out and check? Who, who would go and look into this? We don't go out and check. We send out information at the beginning of every single season to our dealers that we know that store these types of materials. Mm -hmm. right. um, that's all we can do. Or we'll go out by complaint if someone calls us and says, this is what we see. Another issue is like um, standing water and swimming pools. You know, if someone's not opening their pool, um, that that water is stagnant. And again, we're not out looking for it, but if a call comes in, we'll address it. Mm. So this person who's concerned should call the health department. Mm -hmm. And we can't treat on private property. Mm -hmm. That's the other thing, we can only treat on public property. Mm -hmm. But wouldn't just dumping over the water just kind of, mm -hmm. that much... mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's no pesticides involved in that, it's just, Getting rid of the right Get standing of water. The mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Ditch maintenance if it's you know something that needs to be done more on a ground level. Mm -hmm. So if you do go out in a complaint and you find standing water, what do you do? Um, I would send a nuisance letter to remove to have the water removed. Mm -hmm. Even if it's a swimming pool. Yeah, if if they're not using their swimming pool um, or treating it with chemical disinfectant, um, yeah, we would ask them to do something. Mm -hmm. So chlorination is chlorination is worse. Nice. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I live down in one of those neighborhoods. It might be mine that calls a lot, but I don't think so. But we sure could. Um, that uh, I, I have noticed, especially this year, the nuisance mosquitoes are way down. Mm -hmm. So. And the mosquitoes in our traps are way up, so I feel like, yeah, mm. yeah. <laughs> so there's more mosquitoes, actually. There's more mosquitoes, but we're treating our known breeding areas, right. so we're reducing them, but we're trapping um, where they like to go after they breed, so. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Oh, so, so, the, so the can you explain that? Because the mosquito they breed population on the whole you know, throughout Massachusetts is really high this year, just because of our previous season, really wet spring. Um, so the population on a whole is a high, but in Northampton, especially because we're aggressively treating, I feel like our numbers are relatively low for the, our vector mosquitoes. Um, and, but yet we're still getting a lot in our traps, but we're not having to have to test them all because they're not our, our vector mosquitoes. I feel like we're doing a really good job. This is the first season since I've been the director in Northampton that we haven't had any positive West Nile virus, um, mosquitoes, mosquitoes carrying West Nile virus, which is fantastic. I, I, I would like to say it's because we're being proactive. Um, not really sure but we've been doing the same testing now for about four years straight, and then it was kind of intermittent the years prior to that um, because we weren't part of a program that got testing, so we were doing it independently. Um, but yeah, we've not had any positive specimens to date 
what I gave you was I gave you um, the MSDS sheets for the active ingredient that's used in the BTI. And I've also given you just a real um, brief, brief report of the mosquito control that we're doing in the catch basins in the meadow area and exactly which catch basins we're, treat we're treating throughout the city. So if that helps at all. And then again, the number of times we're, uh, you said it, I just didn't catch it, um, treating the catch basins. Three times a year. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Director Lascalia mentioned the cost related to uh, using um, strategies that you that um, are, are less toxic, or um, it, that there's cost related to that. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of your department, I you know I would imagine I don't know how long we've been used. Are these briquettes? Are they? They're briquettes. Mm -hmm. Are mm -hmm. they? Is this affordable? Um, is there? What ec economic pressures are there to figure out around this? I sure. mean, right, and, they're, and they have to be hand placed. So somebody's actually walking the streets and putting them in, or walking in the meadows. I mean, they're not done by any machine, so it has to be done by hand. We spend about, I want to say, 14000 a year on prevention with the briquettes. And about another 6000 a year on surveillance. And the mayor has put this in my budget. Uh, he started maybe about four or five years ago. DPW used to do all the catch basins, um, but the person who had the pesticide applicator's license back then had retired. So we were kind of in transition. And that's when I brought to him this proposal, um, outsourcing it and having it go under the health department because it just made better sense because they treated just um, to treat where it wasn't based on risk of disease. So it saved money. So this is considered uh, a pesticide that requires uh, someone with a pesticide license. It does. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what would you do if you, in your trapping, uh, you found large amounts of vector bearing mosquitoes? So um, I would treat West Nile and Tripoli differently. Um, if it was West Nile, I would do a huge public information push out there. There are guidelines that are given to us by DPH and we've had to use them before when we've had a lot of West Nile virus positive hits and things that I would do uh, on top of just general information to the public is we actually had to ask um, all city and uh, parks and recreation school activities that take place after certain hours that they refrain from doing so. Um, so we've had to do that in the past. We've never gotten to a place where we actually had to do any type of um, treatment outside of that. Um, but just based on the mosquito surveillance, mm -hmm. those were the recommended guidelines by DPH. If it was human disease that was popping up, there was an uptick in human disease, that would look a little differently. Um, we might talk about doing a pesticide application, whether truck mounted or aerial, depending on what the disease was and what our risk of getting the disease is, and DPH will set that. So you don't know which pesticides? I don't. That would be mm -hmm. dictated mm -hmm. by DPH. Mm -hmm. yeah. So you, you've never had to do that in your experience? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't. That's great. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you awesome. so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate thank your you. time and all this information. Great. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yeah, thank, thank you. You too. You too. Thanks. Well, there's a lot to digest. Mm -hmm. Who knew we had so many types of mosquitoes? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. 250? Ah, that's pretty amazing. Um, whew. 
All right. Well, uh, I don't think we're going to be able to digest this information as a, a you know, in a committee meeting, unless you all want to have at least some preliminary discussions uh, based on what we just learned. Um, Are there any more departments we're expecting to hear from? Was I was keeping track of the score. <laughs> Yes. That's it? Okay, cool. Yeah. Nice work. <laughs> um, it just on first blush, it sounds like um, the area um, where we might focus our attention might be on this true green contractor in the high school athletic fields. It seems to be where most of the, herb, the pesticides are being used to maintain this glorious field. Mm -hmm. So that's something for us to uh, chew on. But at the same time, they have the invoices from them. Didn't you say they? They don't have quantities, but they have the invoices. Right. Um, did we ask for copies of those? We did not. About it, but I didn't know if it was a little too pushy. <laughs> okay, well, let's. Um, all right, so we need to ask, and that was only for the high school, so that would be Tony. Mm -hmm. um, I just saw one by. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that would be from True Green. From what period of time, perhaps? Yep, like for what period of time? For all of 2018? Yeah. The, 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 the thing I noticed is that there's different techniques and different approaches being used by city departments. And that, um, that I think that uh, there could be um, some crossover discussion there uh, in terms of practices. I, I was really impressed that all of our rec fields, you know, are 100% organic. And, you know, I played softball for years out at Maine's Field, and I was not aware of that. And that, um, that I mean, it never looked like a lot had been applied there, but the, 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 the turf is actually pretty often in pretty good condition. And, um, that, um, and the other thing is that uh, Donna talked about um, the different practices that they're doing. You know, there's overseeding, there's aeration, um, you know, keeping the mowers at a higher height, mm -hmm. which, you know, in terms of turf is, it, it's a good idea. You know, it's from my discussion. So I took, um, I had to, I support students in college settings sometimes. And one time I got to sit in for a semester on Scott Ebden's turf management class at UMass. And uh, Scott is the, the expert over there, and, and he talked about all of these techniques, these, these different cultivation techniques, as being ways that you can minimize the use of, of chemicals. Mm -hmm. uh, it also matches up with what my neighbor, Bernadette Giblin, who's uh, also a, an expert on um, organic turf management, mm -hmm. that there, there's overlap there. There's other places where the two of them would not agree at all, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of, uh, and, and where the, the difficulty gets into is, is the amount of wear and the expectation of the people using the, the field, the play field. And you were touching on that a bit, Adele, that, um, that um, if the expectation is gonna look like an NFL football field, then um, yeah, that the, you, you, you need to be pretty aggressive. But, um, you know, could it look like Mainsfield? Where, you know, Mainsfield probably doesn't get the wear and tear that, you know, that a football team and followed by a soccer team, mm -hmm. followed by a lacrosse team, <laughs> put on, on a play field. Um, so, 
those are those are the other things that get factored in. Mm -hmm. But um, but I do think that you know there may you know that I, there could be some discussion between the departments mm -hmm. and in terms of what they've learned mm -hmm. and um, that because I, I don't think we can specifically go after a particular um, uh, play field or department for what they're doing, but we can say that we see these different practices and that maybe, you know, because our goal is reduction, maybe there could be some discussion there. Mm -hmm. And that, um, and also in terms of if we're contracting with people, let's take some bids from, you know, I, I know that um, uh, mm -hmm. Councilor Klein was interested in, you know, looking into grants and really taking a look at the costs. You know, mm -hmm. we're, we're being told that there is a trade-off and really, you know, weigh what that looks like. And uh, as Director Lascali was talking about, it's some, you know, she's got to make the, the case to City Council. And um, I, I can't believe they're doing what they are with 300,000 yeah. bucks, mm -hmm. you know. And so, you know, are, are we talking, you know, a 10% increase in, in cost of the overall budget and uh, in increased safety for, you know, all of the citizens, or all of the residents who use those fields. I, you know, that I think that might be something we, we want to consider. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, I just kind of rambled a bit. But anyway, this is all really interesting. It is very yeah, It's pretty encouraging. Yeah, I find it all. Yeah. And when we talk to our, that talk to us. Maybe those uh, seminars that they go to, it's worth it. <laughs> right? Yeah. A question for you, Adele. You were, you were getting at um, when people are uh, applying the uh, bee spray insecticide, mm -hmm. that you're trying to find if there's added things that people do after that other than just leaving it there. And We didn't get a clear answer on that. Right. Yeah. Right. And I wonder what the practice is in terms of those trainings um, yeah. are. You know, that right. do you clean, wash, wipe it down afterwards, or something like that? Uh, now, do they say they have contractors do that, or they do it? They. It sounded to me like if they find a nest, they just spray it. Right. Did they, they get the call? Oh, they, you know, and you know, this is just a case of one one anecdote, but I talked to it janitor person at one school who said, oh, we just go to the hardware store and buy a can of whatever, you know, poison or I don't know, whatever, and spray it. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sting X. Yeah. Well, that's what they have stored in the DPW building or whatever the building was, not the, whatever it was. But um, we don't know what might, might be bought at a hardware store. But the question is, um, is that area roped off so that kids don't start playing in it with I imagine that contamination lasts for a while. So that would be something that I would hope there would be guidelines about. If you spray for a, for a nest, if it's on the ground, mm -hmm. that you put caution tape around that area for X amount of days. Um, I don't know what the number of days is, but I imagine there's a recommendation somewhere. Mm -hmm. I like looking up all of these pesticides because I'm betting a lot of them in very short lifetimes. Mm. Mm. That would be really cool if you could do that. Yeah. You're you're the you're the chemist on right, it. Right, right. Sting X, I would bet it is a really short lifetime. But I look up all the ones I took notes of here. Barricade, escalate. <laughs> um, names crap me up. Yeah, I okay. think <laughs> I love that uh, Chem Long, Chem Long turned and changed its name to Tree Green. Yeah. Who wants a chemical lawn? Um, I'm sorry, were you going to say something? Um, I'm just, I think, you know, bringing up of Charles Park, Charles Wood Park, maybe there's something that we need to look at. They are both privately you know. mm -hmm. owned. Oh, I didn't um, realize Wood Park was Charles yeah. Park. Oh, yeah. And um, Charles Park. Right now, it's being run by your fellow council person, David Murphy. So he's overseeing that through the okay. trust the child's people, family thing. Um, so he's the one that um, 
tough. They have a board, right? Yes. And is he the president of the board? I think he is. Mm. Um, so, and then um, Look Park just has a, a brand new person now, um, superintendent. So I don't know, you know, um, when we do smoking stuff at the Board of Health, we bring in Look Park, and Look Park voluntarily on its own said there was going to be a no smoking park. So it might be something for us to consider. It's where a lot of people go, but it's not city owned, so I don't right. know where we draw the line. Right. I don't think you can do very much about whatever they use. I, I know, but it would be interested in knowing what that is. Um, but I don't know. Um, well, that's an interesting question. I think our mission doesn't specifically restrict us to city owned property. So we could invite them to come in and talk to us. They don't. They don't have to agree. They don't want to. Um, and I would think that it would be possible that one of our recommendations to city council would be to do you know, a massive public education campaign for uh, ordinary old residents of our city um, about the dangers of pesticides and what what you can do instead. You know, it's so difficult because a lot of these pesticides, Roundup being notably one of them, their toxicity data is not very scary. Mm. That's what I was wondering. Is it, yeah. Like, no, in other words, that they've been mentioning. A lot of it is conducted by the company itself. Okay. A lot of these studies. Mm. And they're safe. Of course. Um, and then, of course, there's the problem of you have to test the active ingredient, but you don't have to test the other substances. The carriers, you know, right. The, whatever you call it. The and surfactants and, and the other things that, right. make, that increase the potency of the actual chemical you've tested, but you don't have to test the combination. And uh, that's a big problem. That's a problem on the federal level. Although I suppose our state could change our own rules, but that's that's a whole different scale than what we're doing here, which is we're starting out with Northampton. But if we, if we know the active ingredient, glyphosate, but that should have a have an MSDS sheet, right? But wouldn't that tell us? What are you talking? Which one are you talking well, about? She's talking about glyphosate. glyphosate. Oh, glyphosate. So Roundup, forget the manufacturer. No, the MSDA sheet will not tell you that. It will not tell you No. No, and it may not even, I don't even know if the MSDS sheets for Roundup include their surfactant. That's considered the inner ingredient. Mm -hmm. But it's far from inert. Right. So there's, there, there's a school of thought out there that um, the surfactants Make it much more dangerous. Make make the chemical, the active ingredient, much more dangerous. Which of course is why mm -hmm. they add them. Is because exactly. it's more effective. Exactly. Uh, more effective at killing things. I think I mentioned to you that there is a big um, crowd-funded effort going on in Italy where they're looking very closely at um, Roundup, mm -hmm. and they've already done some studies on early toxicities, and it's very distressing results are coming out of those studies. And these are clearly not company mandated studies. Right. right. Yeah, if you ex if you restricted your view to only One's research that right. was done outside of the company and making the money off of it, you would get a different picture. But who's going to do that research? Right. Right. Certainly, certainly we wouldn't expect federal funds for it exactly. in the, nowadays. Uh, but anyway, all we can do is what we can do, right? Okay, so we have 10 more minutes. We can go ahead and, and um, approve our minutes from our last meeting. Um, so why don't we just go ahead and do that, and then, then we, can, um, we can move on just to one, one other issue. Uh, did anyone have any comments or corrections for the minutes? I'd like to make a motion to approve the minutes. 
I will second that. Discussion. <laughs> all, right. uh, all in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Okay, we've approved the minutes. Um, now, I, I circulated to everyone and got no comments back some draft letters to the people we wanted to invite to the forums. And um, I was always afraid to comment. <laughs> but you can, you, can, you, can, yeah. you can reply back to me. Yeah. And then especially for the letter that you and I are going to co-sign, I definitely want right. your comments on that one. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm assuming that since no, no one had comments that that we're good to go with that text. Does anybody have access to uh, the addresses for the people who we have named so that we could actually send them these invitations? I have to confess I'm opening them up now. <laughs> so the people we're targeting are uh, well, we have quite a list. We have uh, Bernadette, your neighbor. Oh, yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, if you could send me her address, that would be good. We have um, Rich Jasky. We have, oh, Lauren Sanders. Um, uh, somebody named Maggie Leonard. Elisa may have all of this information. So, I, I mean, I, I, I know how to reach some of these people, but not all of them. Um, Len Cohen. I don't know, but at least some may know. We have record of all of the, these. So far, these are all applicants for the committee. Okay. And so we'll have record of them over at the council office. Okay. So that would mean that uh, Laura Kretzler would have access to it for mm -hmm. any that we're, we're in need of. Okay. But I will work on sending out these letters. And, but, but you all have a, have a couple more days to look at the text and, and let me know individually. Let me know. Sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, if you want, if you, we have, change, have improvements to recommend. Um, and then I will get the letters out. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to give feedback to Elisa about the poster. And we're going to get um, addresses for the letters. Are there any other to do's from today's meeting that I'm forgetting? Well, I had a. So, were we going to hear from the Ag Commission? Uh, that's Rich Jasky. So, if Rich will be able to speak to that. Okay. Mm -hmm. that, that makes sense. Um, just a procedural question. Just go ahead. Yeah. Um, I don't have a capability to scan, so oh. these are all the things that people gave us today. I don't know what we'd like to do about that. I can give the minutes to Laura and hand her these, or I can scan. Um, you can. Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. Then I could email them. That's perfect. And I think we were waiting for um, someone else was going to send us something. Um, yes. Um, was it Tony was going to send us? Tony was. Thank you so much, Kate. Tony, no and I think Dave Pomerantz was going to send us something too. And hopefully, if we can yeah. wrote down our, our email address, Dave Pomerantz. Right. So when we get those, well, hopefully, if you're sending them by email, they'll already have been scanned. So right. Okay. So that's great. Thank you so much. Are there any um, um, new business that we want to? Excuse me, can I go back? Do I? I'm not sure I have your email address, Cynthia. Um, that's okay. I can um, send it to you. Let me see if I have yours. Okay. Just... Katie, 
Pete Simmons at Crocker. Pete Simmons at Crocker. Yep. Yep. Dot com. So I'll awesome. see you right now. At my, I'm trying to get to my calendar to see uh, how that our next meeting is. Uh, it wants me to. I'm trying to log into the city. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's a pain in the butt. Sometimes it magically appears, and sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. So I have us down for um, October seventh at ten. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's cons let's send send your ideas to me for an agenda uh, for that meeting. It seems to me we need to digest what we learned today and come up with some ideas for how to move forward. Um, so we could have that as our uh, as an agenda item. Or we could uh, have certain people um, in pairs do some some of this work outside of the meeting. But uh, I'm open for suggestion. When we were planning to invite the people, I mean, we could get some of the interested parties in the next meeting. Um, well, the two forums that we were going to be inviting all those people to. Oh, I'm sorry. That's what the deal is. Yes, that's okay. the deal. Yep, you're right. And those are a little further into October. Mm -hmm. um, it's uh, the 16th and the 21st, October 16th and 21st. Um, so, now we haven't set those in stone, we could consider changing them and making it sooner. Can you just say again how this got changed, just so I have this right? Um, October 16th is not going to be, or is going to be the 7 p.m. There is, yes, there, there is a, an evening. And then the 21st. And the 23rd then the, will be a day. No. No. So then the 21st, sad. which was going to be uh, our new normal 10 a.m. meeting, will now be a 10 a.m. forum. Mm -hmm. And then the 23rd, which was going to be a forum, will now okay. be our meeting. Okay. Is everybody, is everybody clear on that? That's fine. Okay. So I, sometimes I need to repeat it. That's okay. Okay, so the 16th is a forum. The 21st, which typically is a meeting, will be a forum. Yes. At 10. Yeah. And then we're going to do that Wednesday night that was originally a forum and have that as a meeting. Correct. That's the 23rd. Third. Okay, cool. And the 21st is at 10 a.m. Yes. So we have a, <clears throat> okay. the same times that we had on our calendars wow. reserved, but we just swapped what they were. Uh, yeah, I thought it was a great strategy. <laughs> okay. So we'll get those invitations out um, maybe by the end of this week for people to come to the forums. And they will, hopefully, they'll be starting to send us things um, through our Gmail account that we can then start reading. That's once they come to the forum, then they, they do that? Well, we're inviting them to send in information at any time. Oh, OK, in a letter. <laughs> mm -hmm. OK. So we're hoping they will send it in sooner, because if we get a whole lot of information late in October, um, 
it's going to be hard to read it all before our report is due in November. Um, okay, so for our next agenda, we'll talk about the structure of our report, who is going to work on which sections, and we'll work on digesting the information that we have learned today. Does that sound good? Mm -hmm. Also, Alicia had mentioned the idea of a uh, letter to the editor. That was one of the drafts you got. That's oh, that's it? Yeah. Oh, thank you. <laughs> that's okay. <laughs> I, uh, there's a letter to invitees, and then there's also a letter to the editor. Thank you. Okay. Well, and also that Elise and I intend to uh, provide, <coughs> to report out to council at our next council meeting. Oh. So it, we, we, the uh, chairs of uh, committees are allowed to report out uh -huh. towards the start of the meeting. Oh. And um, so we'll give a little overview of what Great. we've been up to and also advise people of the upcoming forms. Oh, excellent. Okay. Great. All right. Anything else to talk about today? Shall we have a motion to adjourn? I'll make a motion to adjourn. I'll second that motion. Uh, any discussion? <laughs> all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, meeting adjourned. Good job. Um.